Okay, hi there. Welcome to a series of four videos looking at the Edexcel Paper 3, the Synoptic Paper. And what I've done here for you is create a, a mini case study on the West African country of Ghana. In the first video, we'll take a look at the data, the extracts, and say a little bit about the context in the background and how to structure the 25 mark question. And then in the three successive videos, we're going to walk through three different types of exam question on the Ghanaian economy, which might appear in synoptic fashion. So these four videos are designed to be to be viewed together. Hopefully together as a whole, they'll form a, a nice coherent revision package for you. So in the Edexcel paper three, uh, of course, you have to write two synoptic essay style questions. You have two data response questions and you have to do two 25 markers. There's no choice of question. Uh, and the simple approach is to take a five paragraph structure. So your first KA point, knowledge application analysis, which is nearly always a micro point. Then you evaluate it, then take a macro point for your third paragraph, evaluate it with a fourth paragraph, and then come to a short final reasoned judgment. And if you can, aim to include at least one developed analysis diagram to help you build up your, your KA points. Of course, 16 um, marks for KA and 9 for evaluation. So they're exactly the same as your paper 1 and paper 2. So let's take a look at the, the, the evidence, the extracts, the background on the West African country of Ghana. Which, of course, is a neighbour of the Ivory Coast, two of the world's biggest cocoa producers in the world. And the first extract is indeed about primary product dependence in Ghana. Ghana's top exports are precious metals, followed by oil, crude oil and then cocoa. And in fact, Ghana is the second largest cocoa producer in the world after the Ivory Coast. They produce over 800,000 metric tonnes uh, a year, uh, generating 2 billion of export revenue in dollars. But the global chocolate industry is worth $130 billion or more each year. And in fact, many smallholder farms, many small scale farms in Ghana and Ivory Coast, um, are essentially living in extreme poverty. Indeed, globally, cocoa farmers get at least get less than ten percent. Estimate here is seven percent of the of the global chocolate value chain. Whereas those who make and sell and brand and market the chocolate grab more than eighty percent. Now, Ghana on the Ivory Coast in two thousand and nineteen, in a bid to increase the prices and the revenues going to the cocoa growers introduced uh, the LID, the Living Income Differential, which is essentially an export premium price. So it's a surcharge of 400 US dollars per tonne of cocoa exports. And it's designed to capture a bigger share of the global uh, chocolate value chain and increase the incomes of cocoa farmers, many of whom live below the $1.90 a day poverty line. The extract suggesting that while, while our LID was passed on to farmers, uh, they got a better price, uh, the higher price and lower global demand has slowed down cocoa shipments significantly from Ghana. Uh, then we have a figure, an extract chart showing the world cocoa price in uh, dollars per tonne. Keep in mind that $400 um, uh, living income differential, which is a fairly high percentage of the world price. Price here is obviously quite volatile. Think of the range. It's been as high as $3,100, as low as under $2,000. The price has been relatively stable since 2018, if anything, marginally rising, perhaps a reflection of supply shortages. So the world price has been relatively stable. But of course, the key issue is what part of that goes to the, to the cocoa growers at the first stages of production. This is an interesting chart. Uh, we'll be using the value of cocoa exports from Ghana. Again, this is in mil millions of US dollars. So it's, you know, if for example, in 2018, it was 2.4 billion dollars of cocoa revenue and you can see here again the revenue the annual value of the exports is volatile that's one of the features it not of primary product dependence you can't guarantee export revenues every year it is dependent on production and the world price and exchange rates and so on notice here that the value of exports from ghana has declined quite sharply from 2018 and was well down in 2020 of course the year of the pandemic the second extract the next bit of the data that you'll often be um, given in the exam is an extract on remittances. Hopefully you've covered remittances as a key topic. Uh, I've got a special video on the economics of remittances you might want to check on YouTube. 
Remittances is a significant source of external financing for many low- and middle-income countries, including Ghana. It's a major contributor to their GNI, their gross national income. Uh, many Ghanaian families depend on remittances from people living overseas to pay for education, health, rent and utilities. Uh, recent remittances to Ghana increased by 5% to over $3.6 billion in 2020. And research from the World Bank suggests that a 1% increase in remittance can drive a 4% increase in the GDP per capita. It's quite interesting data. By the way, on the what I'm doing here with the, with the red bold is just picking up some of the key data that I might want to think about when I'm writing my answer. When you get your extracts in the exam, get that highlighter pen out, work through the data, underline things, circle things, work with the data, and then you can it'll easily come back to it and bring it in as, as application. The rapid expansion of mobile money transfer systems in many sub-Saharan African nations, one thinks of places like Kenya and Ghana and Nigeria, means that people can easily now receive remittances from overseas in their wallet, but although they have to pay a transaction fee. But that then allows them perhaps to, uh, to, to, to enjoy financial services, basic financial services such as savings and insurance linked to the wallet. And this chart, figure three, shows remittances into Ghana, so it's positive in most, well, every year, as a share of GDP. Peaked at over 20% in 2015, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but it's been declining since, although still, still positive. Extract three uh, is important, and this is, the, this is the new tax, a controversial tax that the Ghanaian government has introduced. They've brought in a 1.5% tax on all electronic retail payments, any bank transfers and remittances of more than £10. I've converted to, to sterling to help. And the aim is to raise tax revenues um, and reassure international lenders that Ghana is serious about reducing their budget deficit and controlling their debt. The government also wants to lift tax revenues as a share of GDP. They think it's too low, and therefore they think this is a way of bringing more people into the formal economy uh, because obviously there's been a huge growth of mobile money in, in countries like Ghana. Huge rise in mobile phone take-up. Uh, I think it's like 130 mobile phones per 100 people, yet only 42% of people have a formal bank account. So mobile money has, has become absolutely huge in these countries. Um, and uh, But, of course, uh, the growth potential from that also requires investment in electrification. You need, you need charging points, you need... Uh, regular electricity, only 16%, sorry, 16% of the population still lack access to electricity and transport networks especially. Extract 4, they give you some really interesting, copious, plentiful data on the, uh, on the Ghanaian economy in context of the Human Development Index. Education, healthcare, incomes, and also things like inequality. Some really interesting data there. Ghana comes 138th out of 189 nations that's in the annual survey. The per capita income is just over $5,000 adjusted for PPP. Fairly high Gini coefficient of 43.5. 15% of the income is held by the richest 1%. 13% of people below the extreme poverty line and so on. 31% of young people not in school or employment from the ages of 15 to 24. Uh, and, and really interesting stuff, that big gap, of course, between expected years of schooling and mean years of schooling, with a gap between females and males. Only 29% of the labour force is skilled. And the last one, the ratio of education and health care spending to military spending is just 17%. In other words, military spending, I take from that, is just over five times higher than education and health care spending. And then finally, some, some macro data showing that uh, Ghana runs a trade surplus, but a current account deficit, has relatively low external debt. It's got quite big flows of FDI. Uh, it, it attracts some overseas aid, about just under 2%. But of course, the biggest source of external finance for Ghana is remittances. And that's really quite important. So there we go. That's some background data on Ghana. And what I'm going to do in the next three shorter videos is take you through three different synoptic essay style questions, starting with this one, looking at the micro and macro factors limiting development in Ghana. So if you're doing ADXL paper three, work through these four videos with me and hopefully it'll be a useful revision resource for you. Take care. See you soon.